Hello everyone and welcome back to day 67 of Bitwise. Um, today we continue onward with the self-hosting compiler rewrite. I had a nice break over the weekend, had a little bit of time to think about stuff, but mostly just uh, uh, tried to not do too much programming. Um, so I'm excited to be back on Monday here in Thailand, or uh, I guess maybe it's a weekend if you're uh, elsewhere. Um, so anyway, uh, if you recall last time, we uh, put the finishing touches on the Lexer and um, hooked up um, sort of a client of it that uses the source space for interning and uh, pooling strings and stuff like that. Um, and so I think that's where we left off. Uh, after the stream finished, I also, I mean, this is just a dumb little test case, but I tested doing this kind of standalone re relexing where you just jump to some random position in a stream and start lexing from the middle of it uh, in order to get a token. So uh, I think I'm going to um, do actually one instance of this um, before we jump into the AST redesign. But today I mostly want to talk about the AST because a lot of the stuff with the Lexer is sort of setting things up for the AST, uh, some of the changes I'm going to make. A lot of those changes will be about increased memory efficiency and performance, but also increased quality of uh, things like errors and um, source position tracking w without actually using, w while using less memory than we were previously in the old AST. So one of the features I'll need there uh, is being able to incrementally reparse stuff from a random source position. So um, I want to do that right now. Um, basically, um, so I think what we want to do is something like this. Did I put this in? No, I don't think I've done this before. So you want to be able to do basically, uh, let's see. You have a source base, you have a position, and you want to get back a token. And um, Let's see. I think what you want to do for that is you start out by uh, finding what source file you're in. And if, if there's no source file, we just return a null token. Um, otherwise, we know what source file we're in, and we can basically just create a lexer. Um, and let's see. We should probably package, uh, let's actually make that change now. I think this thing was already growing. Rather than having all this kind of stuff be um, sort of just like a bunch of uh, fields, let's let's put this into sort of a Lexer client interface, or I don't know, Lexer, maybe like, yeah, Lexer client is the right word here. Um, call this. this. Um, so the idea is, you know, when, when you create a, um, when you create a Lexer, you specify the client. And this is just basically how the Lexer communicates to its, its client. Um, and so, let's see here. Uh, oh yeah, the Visual Studio update hosed and I've been Googling about this. It hosts some of the way this stuff works. Um, so anyway, it's not going to be much of a change. I think it's mostly just a matter of putting those in the struct just so they're kind of uh, grouped together, which to me makes sense. Um, and you can even put those into a, a you know, like if the, the client thing could be a pointer to a client or something like that, rather than being in line. But uh, fortunately, we don't have the syntactic distinction between, uh, you know, arrows and dots. And so if we decide to make that a pointer, um, that's not much of a change. So um, I guess what, what will now change is that you will basically just do this. Just right, just client data.
Let's confirm. All right, so this is now the parser. Let's just say. Oh yeah, I remember I. I remember changing this too. So let me just quickly explain that. I think. I made an excuse last time for why it was okay for the source to have a back pointer to the source base, even though in general I said that was not a, a good idea to have. And I, I decided that was a, that was some weak ass excuse making. So uh, all I, I mean, and there was no reason to do it because I, I did it on the spot just due to laziness, I guess. But basically now, I mean, in, in the cases where you need to return or you need to pass them around as a pair, you can just make a tuple, right? I mean, I don't know if this is going to be an official struct, but this is just a combination of a source base and a source pointer. Uh, and so, the, you know, this is now the user data for this Lexer client uh, instance. Um, so I could even do, I could just do this stuff in line because of all these awesome quality of life things. Um, so, so, what is it complaining about? Uh, okay. We should probably do a bulk import of these at some point. Okay. So, I think that still works. Let me just make sure. Looks good to me. Um, Oh, so it keeps happening. Um, I should mention, give some shout outs. There's some people who are good about catching some uh, copy and paste bugs when we did a bunch of those, uh, you know, char one, two, three cases um, on last stream. So some people caught that. So that was good stuff. I guess I should save the solution so we don't have to keep, anyway. Um, Um, okay, so where were we? Right, I wanted to write that uh, source based token function. So the idea behind this is at any given point, you can just give me a position. I will go back and find what that token was. Um, and so we start by just popping this back to where we were. So we, we start by finding what source file we're in, assuming we're in one, assuming someone gave us a legal position. Um, and then once we're there, we can just basically create a lexer. Um, Um, but I honestly don't remember. So we have to give it a base position and we have to give it a, uh, a string. Okay, that's totally fine. So the base position is going to be the start position. I think that's what it's called. Um, the start. Um, so we give it the start position and then we give it just the string. And um, in this case, we actually, so this is a good example. We actually, for, this is part of why we split things up into these callbacks so that we can easily just have them nulled out. We're actually not going to do any, you know, we're not going to do any uh, diagnostics. We're not going to capture any error messages. We're not going to do any string interning. We're not going to do any, um, what you call it? I guess we could do string interning, actually, um, for this case, but we we don't want to do on message. I should probably, in, in in this case at least, I should put in on message. Let me just put that in. Um, yeah, let's leave that out. So so we can actually we can actually just do the same kind of thing. This would probably be made reusable, but. Um, In, in, in this case, we're actually going to do two versions of this. Um, we're going to do this version, which will give you the fully resolved token. So if it's a, a name or something or a string literal, it will actually have the corresponding interned uh, data. Uh, no, we don't really need online. 
uh, we do need on name. I guess we do need on stir, um, which I haven't implemented. So let's just put that in now. So on stir is the thing you get when you have a string literal. It has the same signature as on name, but um, we can just use this for now. Now, actually, what you want to do is uh, you want to start at this string uh, plus position minus. So it's, it's actually starts at this position. And then you want to subtract out start. That's something like this. And then you just return. Next. Um, I guess this is already a pointer, so we don't need to take the address. No field name. Okay. All right, so uh, let's try that. You're only supposed to really, no, I guess you can actually do it even before you fully lex the file. But, but let's, uh, okay, so let's say we now have some position um, and, um, you know, for example, let's just say we, we get whatever, whatever token this is, right? Um, and so it has a start position. And so, so say we go back and we say, well, uh, I want to, you know, get whatever token is at that position, sort of in a random access style. So I think we just say range start. Is that right? Expected. All right. No, this is... um, so let's see what that does. So we get in a position. Let's see what the string is it's pointing to the right thing. All right, so this is pointing to 314. Um, it's pointing at the right position. So this should hit the digit case. Um, okay, so if you look at If you look at toke, so it's, it's 3.15, uh, 3.14. So you can see anyway, these are the same token. Um, even though this one was sort of, well, I guess we also did random access for this, but we did it in a sort of an, an, I don't know how to put it, an unofficial way. Um, but this is sort of the official entry point. Um, let me do actually an even cheaper version of this, which is what we're going to use most of the time. Um, I'm going to do one just called token uh, range. And uh, the way this is going to work is you actually don't need any of these. You can use a totally, uh, a totally blank client. So this is going to be a little bit less set up, I guess. I should also mention we could we could cache a Lexer object for this stuff and just kind of mutate it in place rather than creating it on the stack all the time. But um, anyway, so the idea here is we um, we do basically the same thing, but now we don't even need to worry about filling in the token. We, we're still going to get back a token. Um, 
but the only thing we care about is the start and end. So we're just going to return that. Actually, we're just going to return this. So this, this is actually what we're going to be using a lot. Um, uh, I really need to factor some of this stuff out so I don't have to all deal with all this name stuff. Um, all right, so um, let's say we, we do the same thing. Um, and you just compare these. So if you look at the range here, you can see it's uh, start 11 and 15. And if you look at range, it should be start 11 and 15. So um, I think you see the idea, right? Is that now, given just a position, for a token, since it's the start position for a token, we can go back and very efficiently, since we still have the source text in memory, we can just we can just call the lexer once, and it's this and it's like the fast path of the lexer because it, even if you're trying to do this to a string literal or a um, or like a uh, you know an identifier, they would normally go through an interning hash table lookup or something. This one is actually and, and, and you know that's not slow to begin with, right? Um, but this is even faster than that because we use this null client because all we care about is the range. And so we just grab it like this. And so the idea now is, uh, this is sort of foreshadow what we're going to talk about in a sec, is imagine you have a, uh, you know, you can basically point to a token without actually storing the token. And then you can just query for the token data when you need it. So you can put a lot of data into the token um, but not have to store it anywhere you want to refer to a token. You can just go and retokenize on demand, and it's you know almost free. Uh, the biggest cost is essentially just touching the source text uh, cache line. But a lot of the cases, like if you wanted to do this, for example, if, if for whatever reason you wanted to have source ranges for everything in a file, the source text is always are already going to be like in the cache and hot and stuff, and so uh, it's not an issue. And the other case where you find yourself wanting this kind of information is like, you're trying to report an error somewhere and you want to find out the specific you know range of, of a certain AST node or something like that in terms of character range um, and that you know there's relatively few errors uh, relative to the amount of AST nodes in a whole program right so there may be 10 errors uh, at most say let's in normal circumstances but there's potentially hundreds of thousands of AST nodes in a large uh, code base so this is just kind of optimizing for what matters um, without bloating the AST nodes with way too much data that you might need on, on a odd occasion. You can always go and just get that data when you need it for very little cost. Uh, some cost, if you always needed that data, you would probably store it in line. But given that the cost is fairly marginal and you rarely need it, this is a good way to do it. Um, I wanted to mention one other thing, just sort of, uh, we'll, we'll probably return to this later, but um, let's look at this function here. Um, I mentioned, I think I mentioned, right now we're doing, um, right now we're doing linear search in order to find both the, in the case where we're trying to find lined info, but also what source file we're in from a given position. Right now we're doing linear search. I mentioned we, we will do binary search in the future. I'm not even going to bother doing that. Binary search is easy, but it, it's, it's totally besides the point. Uh, I do want to show one trick though, which is easy to implement even here. Um, and is the kind of thing that will massively speed up a lot of the cases uh, that you want to be fast. And that's called finger search. So the idea behind finger search, I'm going to show you the simplest version of finger search. The idea behind finger search, um, well, I could show you a Wikipedia page. I could also just quickly sketch something out. The idea behind finger search is you have a persistent finger, a cursor, that persists from query to query. And so anytime someone asks for, um, for a lookup, you assume that the thing you're asking for, you, you speculate that the thing they're asking for next is going to be close to the old query's final result or final position, final cursor. And so in the case of the source file, the assumption would be, okay, we found the source file that your last query was in. Chances are your next query is also going to be in that same source file. And we can very easily check that by just doing an interval check. So 
um, what that would amount to basically is um, would be I don't know less query uh, so let's say there was a last source and um, This is the simplest version of it, um, which I think is the most effective payoff you can probably get for this. And there's all there's more refined versions of this you can do, but I think for source files specifically, they're such a chunky big thing that this is really what you want to do. Um, you just remember the last source file you hit, and then rather than doing a linear search, say this is like a thousand files or more, right? Uh, you just always check against this first if it's set. So if there's a last source file. And if the position you're querying for falls within the range of that source file, um, then you just return that source file. So this is just sort of a, a shortcut. Now, if this case is very rare, then this is just wasted work, right? Although it's still very cheap because it's just one check. Um, but you know, if you imagine these cases in practice, if there's an error in a source file, for example, the next one is probably also going to be there. And if you're asking for a lot of, if, if you're querying really densely for position information, they're almost all going to be in the same source file. And you can you can extend this idea to things that are a little more subtle. For example, if you want to find out the line a given position is in, the top, you know, the, if if you look at how we do that for posts info or something like that. Um, Let's call this. You need to call them at whatever. But um, let's see, source of post. Right, so in order to find this detailed layout information about line and column, we always first find this. So this thing will now be extremely uh, accelerated, right? Like it, this will be much faster than binary search even. Like it will basically be as fast as it can be now. Um, there won't be any weirdness uh, when you're doing these coherent things. Now for the line searches, if you imagine you're querying a lot of lines, for example, they're maybe not all gonna be in the same line, but they're going to be nearby lines. So what you can do is you first do this search, right? And then if, uh, you, the, the first thing you would do is you would probably compare it to the current line, but more generally what you would do is you would just say if the distance between, you know, your query position and the last query position uh, that was cached for the finger, if, if, if they're close enough, let's just do a linear search. So, so depending on whether the, the query, uh, the saved query position versus the new query position or, you know, one is ahead of the other, you have to do either a forward search or a backward search um, and so on. And so you can do stuff like that. That's basically the idea that you can do these sorts of uh, local searches if things are close. We're not going to do that now. I just thought I would put in the um, the finger search for the source thing just because that's like the simplest illustration of it and uh, uh, you know very easy to do and effective. So uh, all we have to do for this is uh, I guess. Let's put this in, it can be zeroed by default. Uh, let's call it last query just to make it a little more explicit what, what last means here. Um, Something like that. Okay. Um, all right, so 
going to do probably more of this once we're a little bit further along, but um, I just wanted to give you an idea of the kinds of things you can easily do. This is, by the way, a fairly general pattern. Um, you see it in game programming also. Like, for example, um, if you know about the separating uh, axis test or axis theorem or whatever, it's, uh, I kind of hate that term. It's the separating hyperplane theorem in, in math, but uh, game programmers and I guess uh, computer graphics people have decided to make up their own name for it. But anyway, uh, one of the things you can, one of, one of the ideas behind that is if you have two convex objects, they are not intersecting if and only if there is a separating plane where you know one object is entirely to one side of the plane and the other object is entirely to the other side of the plane. Um, and for, for polyhedral objects, it turns out there's a finite set of, of planes you have to test, like for example, face planes uh, and cross products of edge planes and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, uh, one standard way of speeding that up is if you have two objects and last frame, you find that, found that they were separated by a certain plane, so you know that they don't, didn't intersect, one thing you can do is for that pair, you can store the plane that worked as a separator last frame, and then you always test that first next time you have to test them for, uh, you know, for intersection. And so that gives you like a really cheap shortcut that uh, exploits temporal coherency. Like the plane that worked last frame is likely to work this frame as well. Um, and, and you can see this as being sort of in the same ballpark where the thing that the the the, the thing you searched for that worked last time is a good candidate for uh, trying first next time, basically. So kind of a general principle behind algorithms, um, but um, it's generally only worth it if it's simple. You can make this kind of scheme too complex where it ends up being not an optimization, but a pessimization. But uh, anyways, uh, of course you have to store these things. So in the case I mentioned behind pairs, typically, uh, you need some kind of cache. So maybe what you have in that case I just mentioned is you have a hash table or some other fast lookup structure where you can see if there's a separator cached from last time. Um, but obviously, for example, if you have to store that for all po possible pairs in the whole scene, that's an n-squared explosion. So uh, you might not want to do that, but if it's sort of a sparse thing, then you can use you know a hash table or even just a sorted list or something like that of pairs. Um, but anyway, uh, just trying to connect that to a broader range of algorithmic ideas that may be useful in other contexts. So, all right, let's let's move to the AST proper now. Um, I'm actually going to put this in a separate file, I think. Um, I don't want this to sort of be in the parser per se, but I'll put it in the package for now. Um, so let's see here. Um, Um, let's call this ast.ion. Um, I have to add, well, I mean, ion itself will pick it up, but if I want to get it uh, in my VS solution, uh, I have to rerun my script. I should probably have a way to do that from within Visual Studio, but for now, this is fine for me. So, um, okay, let's start by looking at the old AST and let, let's talk about the kinds of things that will change, and maybe uh, what was what was good about the old AST, what was bad about it. Um, so the old AST was um, a fairly kind of standard design. Um, if you do these things in C, or even actually in functional languages, although of course the C approach is a little more barehanded than what you see there. Um, but you know, for example, uh, you know, roughly there's um, let's see, you have uh, Three, I guess, three major classes of AST nodes. There's basically expressions, statements, and type specs. So expressions and statements, those are self, self to, uh, you know, I think you know what those are. Uh, type specs are, you know, the syntactic way of specifying a type. So it could be a simple name. It could be a, um, what you might call it. It could be like a function pointer or something like that. Oh, and I guess the other thing is there's certain top level declarations as well. Those are important decals. Uh, so decals can be, you know, function declarations, struct declarations, type defs, imports. It's all of these sort of top-level entities that are defined with a declaration. Um, and the, you know, the basic design is going to remain, which is that all of these are basically, you know, discriminated unions, tag unions, variants, whatever you want to call them, meaning um, they all have some kind of tag that says, you know, what kind of expression am I in case they're expressions. What kind of declaration am I if they're a decal? 
Um, and then you have a union which uh, ha is filled in differently depending on what kind of thing you are. So in this case, if you're a parenthesized expression, well, then you have some sort of inner expression um, that you point to, that, that you know, the parentheses are wrapped around and so on. If you're a literal, what's your literal value and stuff like that. Um, so some of this stuff, I mean, so some of it is a little bit ad hoc in terms of the naming conventions and whether uh, I'm using inline structs like this or move, moving things into separately declared structs and whatnot. Excuse me. Some of that is going to be kind of uniformized and, and, and standardized, but um, for the most part, it's going to basically stay the same. So let me mention a few changes. If you look at our old source position, oh god, they really blew it up. This ES update. All right, the old source position was um, basically a name of a file and a line number, um, and so this was kind of not great right like this is fine this is really big actually like this is eight bytes on 64 bits and this is four bytes um and it doesn't even have column information and in fact it also doesn't it only this one only corresponds to the sort of start position of the node it doesn't even have the range and it will turn out that for a lot of things we want to do you actually need not just the start position but you need the end position as well um and so if we wanted to scale that up to having both start and end, it would be, what, 16 plus 8. So it would be 24, right? Like that's, um, that's a lot of, lot of info. So with our new representation, we have actually, uh, we have the same thing, although we have to do a little more work in order to extract the same information. But we have more information ultimately, uh, although it takes a little more computational work to extract. But we can store, a start, you know, one position and... 32 bits or four bytes, and um, the second one as well in, in four bytes. So eight bytes total versus 24. Um, so that's a huge savings. And this is something that goes on pretty much every AST node, right? Because every AST node, you want to be able to reference it to its location and source text in terms of you know reporting errors and stuff like that. Um, and so um, this is a huge savings. Now, why does memory matter? Uh, let, let me actually show you. Uh, small example I put this in last week just in order to give me an idea of what the um, of what the memory usage was like and this is a I want to I want to emphasize that this is a very sloppy AST in terms of memory usage I, I never really tried to do anything in terms of uh, using compact representations or anything in the old AST I, I just went for kind of convenience um, but now I want to tighten that up um, okay. So, so let me just run to here. So I have some basic memory usage tracking uh, that I put in. And, and you get this every time you run now, um, just so I don't ignore it. So um, this is fairly typical. Like I said, my AST is a little bit pickish. Um, but if you look at things like Clang, um, Clang actually has a compact representation of source ranges that mine is uh, is inspired by partially, uh, meaning they also have 32-bit uh, sort of a pig handles that they can resolve to more information on demand. Um, but they have all kinds of other stuff in their AST that makes it makes it huge. But um, if you yeah, so if you look at what this is saying, so this is for only test one dot uh, ion, right? Which uses a few other packages like STD and the built-ins and some libc stuff. But, you know, this is a fairly small project. So you can see that the source file itself is, I guess this is uh, 90 kilobytes, right? Um, so, uh, uh, and you can see roughly there's half as much intern text as there is source. Generally, you expect this ratio to get smaller because the intern uh, table is sort of like all the unique all the unique names in the source code and you generally expect that to grow at a much slower rate than the source code right because it's kind of like compressing repeating names um, but the thing that tends to grow proportionately to the source well actually it always grows proportionately to the source is the AST size itself and here uh, this ratio is measuring the ratio of the AST and the intern data to the source code um, I think if you just do um, if you just do, yeah, so I should probably not 
actually include the intern memory. I don't think that's useful because, like I said, calculating a ratio kind of implies that they're proportional in some way, but actually the intern and source code, I think, are never in practice proportional. They may scale in like square root ratio or something weird, but I don't think they scale the same. Is it great? So anyway, let's just look at the ratio of the AST memory usage to the, uh, the input source code memory usage. You can see it's roughly 8.5 to 1, meaning for every for every byte of source te text on average, there's eight bytes of sort of data structure corresponding to it. Um, this is not unusual, but it's pretty huge, right? Like it means that if I have uh, a megabyte of source text, I will have, uh, you know, say around eight to nine megabytes of AST, um, which is not insubstantial. Um, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's also not the end of the world for modern computers. But it's, it's worth staying on top of, nevertheless, uh, when, when we can. And so um, just wanted to measure this for the old compiler, just so when we start doing stuff, we can kind of use it as a benchmark. Um, if you go and look at the old AST and sort of identify the most uh, bloated elements, uh, just me kind of eyeballing it, the things I would say are uh, there's, there's a few things. One is that, yeah, we do stuff like the source position that can be more compact. But now that we have to put in a range instead of just a single position, maybe that kind of shakes out to be about the same before and after, although we do get additional capabilities with that change for us. So, um, but, but this is probably not going to be the biggest change overall. Um, another big thing is that um, um, if what we care about is the total memory usage, um, we basically what, what we've been doing so far is that anytime we allocate an AST node, we're always allocating the same space. So let's look at some examples to see how much disparity there can be between the best case and the average case and the worst case in terms of required memory usage. If you have something like a parent expression, the only data you strictly need to store is one pointer, right? So you need to store one pointer for this type of expression. But then you compare it to some of these other cases, uh, especially this one, which I, I noticed uh, the other day is very uh, bloated. There's uh, two pointers, an eight byte float, uh, and this one is, I think, is an enum, so this is going to be four bytes. So this is what? This is, um, <coughs> excuse me, 64 bit. This is 8, 16, 24, 28. So this is 28 bytes. Um, but because we're currently allocating the same size AST nodes for all expressions, <coughs> excuse me, um, we basically end up like the, 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 the heaviest node ends up sort of costing everyone because we allocate a fixed size for them. So even though this one only requires eight bytes, we end up paying 28 bytes for that. Now, th this disparity is probably the most extreme there is for expression nodes. Um, but, you know, it, it occurs to a lesser extent in other cases. Like, for example, for a binary operator, um, you can, you know, this would be, say, 16 plus 4. And actually, this can be, I have, we, we can factor this into the header where there's some padding room we left over. So let's just say this after that factorization, this is eight. You still have eight, or not eight, uh, 16. You still have 16 versus 28. That's still roughly uh, 20, uh, sorry, 50% larger than it needs to be. And things like binary operators are the bread and butter of an AST, right? So the, the, the point is another major source of savings we can get is if we only allocate the space for each kind of node that we actually need. That way we get something, uh, you know, the thing that matters for total memory usage is the average per node memory usage. Uh, and a lot of these cases that are a little bit heavier weight, well, first off, we'll find more efficient ways of representing them. For example, this case here, um, the reason we needed this was because I wanted to get the literal representation of the float directly from the input text. Now that we can get this from the source range data, we actually don't need to store this at all. So this would also go away, even for this case. But in general, we want to disconnect the worst case and the average case memory uses for these node types. And so that's very easy. All we need to do is when we allocate an expression node, we need to check, we need to select the size of the node we allocate based on the specific kind. That's it. Um, so that will be a nice savings. Uh, if you look at statements, I think those are actually, statements are by far, from what I can tell, the biggest uh, memory hog, um, because statements can have a lot of stuff attached to them. Like this is probably the most extreme case. Let's see here. So an if statement, um, so this is 8, 16. Let's not even look here, but let's just do those. 8, 16, uh, 24. And, and this is also, this is uh, 32, um, 
I don't even know how big these are. Uh, man, I hate how they... Yeah, I mean, this thing is bloated as heck. Like, this, this thing is, this thing has to be like 50 bytes or something like that. Um, whereas, if you look at most statements, they're probably, like, most statements are like an expression statement um, where you're just calling a function. Like this one, this is an expression statement. This is just like you have an expression being used as, an, as a statement, like calling a function or something like that. Um, or... Um, or, an, or an assignment where an assignment is, you know, it's more like, you know, maybe twice that, but like, let's say 16 bytes instead of eight for the simplest case of a, an expression statement. So stuff like that, right? Like you can see here, there's also massive disparity between the average case and the worst case. And if we allocate exactly what we need for a given type of statement, we will get some good savings there. Um, and so I did some just very rough back of the envelope math, not based on very detailed measurements, but just sort of eyeballing it. And I think we can probably get a factor of two savings on this by just um, allocating exactly what we need rather than using the same size for all nodes. So um, that's uh, those are basically the two things that I'm kind of doing in terms of more compact AST representation uh, using these sort of abstract positions that can be resolved to additional information on demand, and then uh, var variable length allocations for the different kinds of AST nodes, like subkinds, whatever you want to call them, variants of statements, variants of expressions. Uh, one thing that I'm not going to do, even though it can give you a good savings, I just don't think it's worth it, um, for us at least, for me, um, is to replace all pointers with handles. So you can replace all pointers with handles. Um, and so on 64-bit, that gives you a factor of two savings for all pointers in the AST. This is probably, in terms of net savings, represents, on top of those that factor of two I just mentioned, that probably represents an additional, at least maybe a factor of two as well, um, but only on 64-bit. And given that I'm more worried about our low-end machines that this will have to run on once we get to the embedded system. It doesn't help that at all. And in fact, it probably makes that a little bit slower because now it can no longer do direct pointer derefs. It has to go through an array or some other kind of handle table. Um, so I decided that even though that's in general can be a good optimization um, to replace 64-bit pointers with indices, um, I think most of the bang, bang, uh, bang for a buck comes from making those aforementioned and changes and just sticking with pointers for the AST uh, links, the, the links between different AST nodes. So anyway, that's uh, that's my thinking on that in terms of what is basically going to change. Um, so let's um, let's start sketching some of this stuff out. Um, I'm probably just going to keep a separate um, Actually, I'm just going to keep it on my other monitor. You guys can't see it, but you don't really need to see this. Um, so um, let's start with expressions. Those are probably the simplest kind of thing. So um, we do have anonymous union, so we can use that same thing. Um, I've decided to use a naming convention um, for variant data, which is the initial letter of the type followed by, so I always use zero as a sentinel value so you can detect uninitialized data. Um, so it's going to be something like this, and my convention is the associated piece of data with that variant kind is always going to be called, you know, initial letter and then parent, right, in this case. So it's going to be totally consistent. Um, the reason I chose to use the initial letter is that uh, in, in many cases you could just, I mean, first off, it provides a little bit of kind of, I guess, tagging, syntactic tagging that you're dealing with this kind of variant data. But the other thing is a lot of the names we're going to have to write are things that are going to collide with reserved words because we're writing the compiler in its own language. So for example, if you get to declarations, you want to be able to write stuff like defunct. And for statements, you want to write stuff like if. 
And you can't write that because it's a reserved word. And by having this one character tag, we don't sacrifice too much verbosity, but we, uh, we can write the name kind of literally without having to special case just those identifiers that would otherwise clash. So that was, that's kind of my reasoning for that. Um, so right, for eParin, um, we are going to, um, I guess, just do this. Um, and I would also say in general, for a lot of these, I'm going to create se separate structures. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm like basically the only case where I'm going to um, store stuff in lines, as it were, is um, when there's just one piece of data. In, in the old code, if you, if you let's see if I can bring it over. Um, in the old code, I used a lot of these anonymous structs. This is actually, kind of a form of laziness. Um, and since we're doing a public API, you really don't want to do this. You want all of these types that are like this. You want these to actually have name types associated with them so that if you have to create a public API, those are things that can be pointed to and named as opposed to being kind of implicitly declared. So um, I'm going to move away from that completely as much as it's a useful shortcut at times, it's not appropriate for a public API in my opinion, uh, especially one that needs to be able to work interlanguage. Um, so, so for, for stuff like that, I will just say, um, so the next case would be uh, int and float. And for those, I'm just going to say like this. And then we're going to put these into separate structs. And um, I think this is just going to be this. And there's going to be some flags about it. Um, um, the question is, should these flags be in the thing itself? I don't think they should. Um, and so actually, we don't need to actually have structs for these. So Never mind. The reason these needed structs in the original is because we, and again, this is a dividend now we're getting uh, from, from, from having a kind of reversible way to go back to the source text and get the detailed token information. In the previous AST, in some of these cases where for the C code generator, we wanted to be able to preserve some of the intent from the source text, like what suffixes you are using to specify a given token or whatever for, for integer or float literals. Um, that stuff is now something you can just go back and to retokenize using the range, right? So uh, we no longer need to sort of ad hoc include pieces of that information, uh, which saves space and also just makes things cleaner. I always felt very dirty about that, but um, now we get a chance to do it right. So next case is stir. And again, we can just have a pointer to the stir. Uh, we don't, in the previous one, we also had a modifier. So you knew for a string literal, is it multi-line or is it not? Uh, now you can just go back and get that information if you care about it. But in most cases you don't. If you're just, you know, doing normal AST processing, you don't care whether it was multi-line or not. That's really more a concern if you're doing source to source transformation, uh, either for code formatting or for generating C code. Um, then we have ename, which is, you know, just an identifier. So let me just put this in here. Um, then we have size of expression, size of type. Um, so this would be e size of. So previously, um, let me think about this. Um, so previously, um, we have these two variants. Like you can write size of. Um, you can write size of expression and you can write size of type spec. So these are sort of the two variant syntaxes. Expression can also be a simple type name, like you can just write int, but um, syntactically, this is a, in one case it's an expression, in the other case it's a, uh, a type spec. Um, one thing that kind of annoyed me in the old AST is that, um, let me just bring it over to show you, is that a lot of these cases, it felt like for something that was kind of fairly basic and maybe didn't really deserve to be represented very explicitly in the AST. All these cases called for a bunch of different, you know, you needed like, I think the reason that I never added count of is purely because I felt like, man, now I need to add yet another case of that. Um, 
it seems like maybe these should be kind of unified. Um, but they're not all the same. Like, for example, offset of has some more information. So actually, you know what? These should, probably should be separate. I think that's totally fine. Um, that is totally fine. Um, although maybe I will move these kind of to the bottom of the list. I feel like these kind of belong in a slightly, they're almost more like intrinsics, right? Like or macro type things. So let's, uh, let's move those later so they don't gunk up the primary types of things that are probably more important to focus on. Um, then you have a compound expression, which is for literals. And this is definitely something where you need uh, a separate struct because this is a little bit more custom. Um, So here you need um, the type, which can be null. Um, and then you have compound fields, which... Um, so what, another thing we're going to change from the last internal representation is that I shied away from using stretchy buffs um, in the representation itself of the AST. So I would use stretchy buffs to build up the dynamic lists, but then I wouldn't use them internally. Um, I think I'm going to use them internally. I'm still going to have temp buffers, but then when I copy them in, I'm going to allocate just the right size stretchy buff just for those fields uh, that we need. Um, that might be a little bit more bloated in terms of the AST size because the header of a uh, you know of a, of a stretchy buff A array is is more than just the minimum size of this. Like there's a little bit more in the header, but. Um, I think I'm okay with that just for interop because otherwise, you know, it's nice just to have everything be based on stretchy buffs where it makes sense. I'm not too worried about the blo the bloat from that because relative to the number of AT AST nodes uh, and stuff, I don't think that really adds up that much. There's not that many lists uh, where an extra eight bytes is going to kill you there. Um, so, um, so yeah, right now this move back. Right now this is compound field, which I guess is just like a name of uh, let's see, name and index. Um, I'm going to try to not use tuples, even though it's convenient for all these one-off things, but again, I want to have some named things. So this would just be like Compound fields. Um, this thing is going to get a little bit long, but this is not something you see all that much. Um, each of these needs a range. Um, There's an initializer, and I guess there's either a type or a name. So basically the idea here is this is something like, you know, this could be like this, but it could also be like this, and it could be like this, right? So there's basically for every field, there's three possibilities. There could be no explicit um, index or name, or there could there could be an index, which is numerical, which is specified by an expression, or it could be just a flat name. Um, so I think the way I was doing it before is probably not the way to do it. Um, so compound expression, compound field, color. Um, even though this is long, this is not something you use very often, so I'm not too worried about reducing the uh, length of these identifiers. So let's just say there's default um, or none, which means no auxiliary data. Um, 
uh, and then there's name, and there's index. Um, there's always an expression, so that part is always there. Uh, and then there's the optionally, in the case where there's a name or an index, there's something associated. And so I guess we'll call that C, a compound. Um, or maybe F for field. Um, yeah, let's use that. Let, let's use that convention. When we have sort of a multi-part name, uh, it's the last part that we use the initial O. So it's field name, um, or it's field index. Um, this one, I guess, does not really need uh, a position of its own because this refers to, this is just, yeah, this does not need any additional thing. This is just the, gets the range from the parent. Um, okay, so next up, we have compounds, we have casts. Um, so casts. Casts have a type spec, and they have a um, they have an expression that they're casting. Um, modify. This is a little bit of an awkward naming. I think this means yeah. This is definitely not what I would do. I think. Um, This is another thing I should do is to put this first. This is just a padding thing um, to save space. So I want to make this basically a uint8. Um, so eight bytes for that, which means we have basically this whole thing, because there's pointers in here, is it going to end up being eight byte aligned on 64 bit? But that means that if we have eight, uh, if we have one byte for this, we basically have seven, and even a 32 bit, we have three more bytes. We can put other stuff here. So I'm actually going to put some things up here, even though they're technically part of the variant. Um, and so this is going to be stuff like, um, like all the various types of operators you can see basically. Um, And so that way, when we when we get to this modify case here, first off, this is not necessary, and in fact, the post thing is not necessary either. This is just going to be part of the op, um, and so um, I think actually this just turns into a unary case like this. Um, so a unary operator. Basically, like post increment and pre increment and whatever, uh, both increment and decrement. That's what this modify thing was supposed to cover. And I think they just become unary operators now. Um, and so, the, you know, for example, for this case, this is going to be stuff like uh, post ink, uh, pre ink, uh, post deck, um, pre deck, stuff like that. Um, So this just falls into the class of unaries. Um, so yeah, unary, we just covered that. Then there's binary, which are, there's two, two possibilities. Um, it's just two things. So you can the op stored up here. There's ternary. I guess calling it ternary is, I'm just going to call it cont. Um, so then you have the condition itself, you have the consequent, um, and the alternative, I don't know, I always, I was originally calling them then expression and else expression, which are awful certain occasions. Uh, Cont, 
then and else what's better names um Let's call them this. Um, and then a call has a call has uh, I guess I would call it the head, which I didn't call it before, but that seems like a good name. And then the args. Um, and the args for us can just be a stretchy buff. Um, and there's also an index expression, which is when you're indexing an array or pointer. Um, Maybe we just call this expression. Um, and then for the call, or, or yeah, for the index, you, know, you get this. For the next one, it's a field. Um, it's a similar deal, except now there's a name attached. Um, and then there's a new expression, which is a recent addition or allocation. And for that, we have you know the allocator, which is optional. We have the length, which is also optional, and then we have the uh, I guess the source is that the right term? The source, which is uh, the thing you're copying from, which can also be null if you're doing an uninitialized allocation. So anyway, I think this is pretty much it. This looks massively cleaned up from what we had previously. Now I just need to go back and add a bunch of, so previously this was another kind of um, nasty intermingling of lex, lexer stuff with parser stuff. I was using the token kind to designate the operator. Uh, that's definitely not the right move, uh, but it was just a source of laziness, so I didn't have to, um, you know, so I, so I didn't have to make a new enum for everything, but that was, again, misplaced laziness. Or maybe it was well-placed at the time, but uh, not now. So um, let's go through the Lexer and see what we can get. Um, I'm just going to bring this over on my other monitor where you guys can't see it, but I can. Um, so let's see what operators are here. Uh, neg and not. So there's not. There's. Um, I should probably call it bneg for bitwise negate. Um, so let me use that B for bitwise so then I can just write B and that means bitwise and um, so not is logical not that's the sign um, bitwise not bit, and then let's see what are the so there's neg I guess I should call this bitwise not um, so let's say there's negation, there's um, say unary operators. Um, negation, this is just minus. Not, this is this. B not is this. This is also a unary. Uh, this is this after, and this is 
this before. Okay, so that's looking okay. Um, and I guess there's also plus, um, which is just prefix plus. Not very useful normally, but there. Um, do we actually support that currently, isn't it? No, let's not worry about that, but um, that should definitely be supported. If it isn't, we'll add it. Um, then we will have uh, binary operators. And that will include um, multiplication. Just make a bunch of templates here. Division, modulo, and and I guess this is actually bitwise and, and then L shift, R shift, and then add sub XOR. Don't really have to say bitwise, it's I guess implied. Then four, which is bitwise or. Um, And then, let's see, EQ, not EQ, uh, LT, GT. Let's just call this NEQ. Um, and then LT, EQ, GT, EQ. Um, and then AND and OR, these are now the logical variants. Then we get to um, assignment operators. Um, these are technically not expressions. Maybe the way we should do this is actually, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to have a unified operator struct. Um, this is going to be just op. Oh, right. I'm just going to call this op um, without over concern for whether it's sort of a statement type of thing or a uh, expression kind of thing because ultimately maybe that's a finer distinction than we need to make and it's convenient to not have to have two of everything. Um, maybe I will change that. It's not a huge concern right now. So let's say there's op set, there's op add set. So these are all the you know, various kinds of assignment operators, which in our language are statements, not expressions, subset, um, or set, um, and set, XOR set, L shift set, R shift set, mall set, div set, mod set. And there's also colon set is probably a separate category, like init statements. So those don't go here, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll split these into a separate, you know, but for now, let's just do this. Um, this is just a generic op now. All right. So let's see what we have. All right, so all this crap can go. I'm going to move this above everything else. Um, let's 
and see if it makes sense to me. I think it does. Typo. E field, do we do E index? No, we didn't do E index either. So cunt, call, we didn't do call. Call index field new, call index field new. Okay. So this is probably reasonable. Um, so now if you just kind of get an idea of you know, I think this already shrank things quite a bit. We have this out now. So this header basically is going to be, this is eight bytes, this is one byte, this is another byte. Could be two bytes, doesn't really matter because we have plenty of padding space left over. But overall, this is going to be, on 64-bit, this is going to be 16 bytes for this header, this common header, and then there's going to be uh, potentially eight more bytes uh, for some of these, but, um, you know, literals and unaries and parenthesized expressions are only an additional eight bytes. A few more are, uh, you know, binary have two things, so they're 16 bytes. Uh, and then there's some cases that have a bunch of auxiliary stuff, like compound literals, which are variable length in terms of their associated info. But, um, yeah, this seems like a, a nice cleanup of what we had. Um, let's look at, let's, uh, let's wait with, uh, let, let's do statements last. Those are the messiest. Um, let's do type specs. So probably the simplest. Maybe we should have done those first. So type specs are um, how you specify type syntactically. Um, so what do we have? We have simple names, and we need to say int. We have funks, we have arrays, we have pointers, we have when you write const, we have tuples, a recent addition. Um, and so what do we need to go along with that? Um, there's stuff here that I don't remember. Names, list of names. What the heck is that? A list of names associated with a type spec. there always just be one name? Why is it this type spec name has a whole array of things? Let's ignore that. I, I don't think that's necessary. I don't know what that's about. Um, so, okay, let's just go through them. So certainly one case is when you just have the plain name. So you just write int and you have the interned string pointer to that. Then you have, um, if there's a func, there is a bunch of data attached here. For this case, um, this is going to be actually expanded from what we had before because I did not have, in my old type specs for funks, I did not have names for parameters. You had to just specify the type spec. That's actually a mistake. The reason I chose not to put that in is that I didn't have a way to exploit it in the old design for the type resolver because I over normalized. And so, in order to keep all function signatures uh, canonical, I, I didn't have a way of storing uh, name parameters and the types themselves. Um, but now, with my new design that I haven't really discussed yet, I do. And so we definitely want to store that kind of information there. So what I mean is I should be able to do something like this. Um, you know, I should, I, I, I don't have to, but I, I should be able to write, you know, x colon. I should, I should be able to do this, but I should also be able to put this in. And then if I have, say, a, a variable of this type, of this function pointer type, I should be able to use named named arguments to call it using, you know, if, if for example, suppose you have f colon equals this, um, I should be able to do, you know, something like this. So it's actually important that these names, name parameters are attached to the type itself. And we didn't do that in the old 
file system. So that's going to be added. And so type spec func has, um, let's see, what does it have? Well, it has args, um, so or params, I guess I should really call them. Um, so we have a bunch of params, and um, let's see. Okay, I'm switching between C and just because I'm looking at the C code on my other monitor, so it's <laughs> it's easy to switch the operand order here. Um, so we have some func parameters. We have just a boolean that says whether it's variadic. I think more generally, though, basically you need some sort of flags. So um, let's just put that into flags. Um, and so this will start out with. Um, Explicit about it. Um, yeah, so type spec function has flags, has parameters. The parameters um, have an optional name. Um, and then a non-optional type, and that's it. There's also a return um, return type. Again, optional if it's not specified. Syntactically, it means semantically that it's void. Um, so I think that's it for this case. Um, what is it? So that's names. It's funks, and then for arrays, um, type spec array. For arrays, you basically want a base type, and you want a expression, a constant expression, potentially a you know empty, like an unspecified expression that specifies the length. So you write stuff like. You write uh, one plus two, right? Something like this. Um, so that's it for that. And then there's pointer. I think for pointer we just write. Um, we can just do this directly. Uh, tuples are interesting. I think I'm going to have a notion of a param that's actually more generic because we need this for tuples as well. Um, in fact, one of the things that guided my design for tuples uh, and also helped me think about sort of backwards to functions is I wanted to keep all uh, almost everything consistent between the two cases in terms of the syntax and most of the semantics um, in terms of like optional parameters, name parameters, and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, tuples also have, uh, they have fields. Um, but this is just the same as the param struct. Um, but these can also, also be optionally named. Um, I kind of feel like even though I, I kind of feel like I want to do this, to be honest. Um, I didn't do it for some of the expression cases, but um, okay. So that's it for type specs. Um, let's see here. Um, the other really big one is decals. So let's do decals. So 
let's see, what do we have here? Decal kind. So we have just copy and pasting. These are declarations. Um, all declarations have a name. That's a primary characteristic. So that's not like an optional thing. It's really the thing. Um, I think we want to have some decal flags. Um, don't really need that actually. So let's say for these decal flags, um, you know, this is just like one of the flags. Like a declaration can be incomplete, meaning, um, you know, it, it's been declared but not defined, basically. So this would be used for foreign declarations and maybe other things as well. Um, but let's just put this into a flag. Like rather than using these booleans, which are needlessly space wasted and, and also just when you get a lot of these booleans they just kind of gunk up the struct it's nicer to have them in a, in a single flag just for uh, like even just on the screen not having so many fields to look at um, so let's see so we have enums let's maybe do the each of these cases is you know fairly let's maybe do some of the simplest first so uh, type defs uh, a type def is just really, you know, there is a, a type spec, and that's it. Um, for vars, um, for vars, you have um, two parts, potentially two parts. Um, you have the type spec, and you have the expression, uh, which I guess, I guess is the the init. Um, sorry, it's not decal. Um, for constants, you have something kind of similar. You have uh, an optional type specifier. Whatever the value is, um, so let's just move these up to correspond to the order of defining them in. The type def of our const. Um, what, once this is a little bit further along, you actually want to stop using implicit uh, implicit um, numbering of these things and use explicit numbering because at that point there's some sort of stable API guarantee and you don't want to just be able to reorder them and break uh, external uh, binary code or whatever that uses fixed, uh, has assumptions about what numbers correspond to which cases. Uh, structs, enums, funks, notes, imports. Um, okay. Let's do import, decal, import. So an import has, let's see, um, some of this is a little bit disorganized in terms of the structure. Import all, import item. Um, so I think the case it's trying to support is like you can do um, you can do this, and then also optional. Um, something like this. Um, 
I guess you can also have an optional ellipsis and stuff like that. Anyway, not, not, this, this grammar is not totally right, but just to sort of organize our thoughts. So you can, you specify first off the package path. So let's call this package path maybe. Um, you can assign that to a name by which it can be accessed locally in, the, in this source file or this package. And then there's a bunch of import items and those are comma separated. Each import item can just be a name or it can be a name equal to another name. Uh, and there can also be an ellipsis which just designates a wild card. Um, I have to go to the bathroom real quick, but yeah, we'll do it this time. Um, so right now the fields I have for the um, for decal imports in the old AST is a little bit scattered. I have one flag that says is it a relative import, and that's to deal with the case where you can do you can do this, which means um, if you know Python, this is sort of a similar thing. If you use a prefix dot, it means import relative to the current package directory or package path current package path. Um, I'm not sure that should really be a flag like that. And then you have a list of names corresponding to, you do something like this. Um, and then there's a flag if you want to import all for wildcard. A number of items and blah, blah, blah. Um, maybe I will skip that for now um, because there's maybe some stuff I should think about because I think some, some of the way I'm packages and imports statement uh, declarations work right now is not how I want it so shouldn't think too much about that right now. Um, okay, what's uh, another example? Um, okay, so certainly there's uh, structs and uh, unions, those are both aggregates. They can share some stuff here. Um, aggregates are, let's see, aggregates 
I guess have a kind. Um, seems redundant. This is probably a mistake in the old design because previously, on the one hand, maybe I didn't actually distinguish structs and unions at the top level. No, I do. So there's kind of some redundancy there where in the old AST, I both had a distinction between decal struct and decal union, which is certainly correct. Um, but then the underlying that that shared substructure aggregate had another kind flag to distinguish them. I think that was probably put in so that you could refer to the aggregate part without knowing where it came from, but that seems to me a mistake. If you want to do that, just refer to the whole decal struct and you have everything you need from that. So that kind flag is not correct. And then you have items. Um, and an item is... Um, well, you have you have a range first of all, um, and here you do actually need kinds. So decal aggregate item kind decal aggregate item kind. So you can have a field, or you can have what I call a sub aggregate, just a little bit of a mouthful, but that basically means you have like some kind of anonymous union or struct um, just flattened inside you. Um, and so oh, I guess that's why I did it that way. So, so I guess I will just do it this way. Substruct, subunion. Maybe that's a mistake. Maybe the, what I was doing before is the right move, but um, let's see. Aggregate item, so this would be I sub aggregate, or uh, I substruct. This would be a decal aggregate. I subunion, decal aggregate. And then the other case is. I field um, which is about that actually. Um, so the aggregate field, what does it have? It has a list of names. So you can do XYZ equals float. Um, and then it has an associated type. Um, okay, so that covers, let's see here, covers these. That's probably enough for now. Let's see how we're doing on time. Then I want to write some code that uses this before. Okay, so I've gone an hour and 40. Let's go another 30 minutes and do something with it um, because otherwise it's just going to be a bunch of data entry. I mean, it needs to be done, but... Um, ooh, type completion cycle. Um, let's see, so this refers to Decal aggregate. 
Oh, interesting. This shouldn't actually be a type completion cycle because this is a pointer. So that's interesting. I guess I don't handle that correctly right now. That's okay. Um, but I've been trying to go through and make everything consistent in terms of that. Actually, let me just fix that and compile it real quick. So this would be resolve decal struct complete struct. Um, so this is going through this stuff here. Um, Um, you should probably centralize this, but like. Uh, it name incomplete decay. It type it offset. Well, let's see. I see what it is. It's not actually here. Well, this is the correct place to do it also, but um, it's actually over here. Um, yeah, we already do it here. Do the incomplete decay. I'm gonna waste more than another uh, moment on this, but okay. So these have already been decayed, so actually we don't need to do that. So 
sorry guys. It's not really important to be honest, but uh, I will just plug in that off stream. Um, basically the point is, the way I, I have set most things up now, and there's still a few cases remaining, is that when you use this, uh, it will be treated as a pointer, basically, rather than an incomplete size array in these sorts of contexts. I'm, I'm starting to use it for documenting stretchy pops basically but anyways um, okay let's just roll with that um, okay let's see here let's do a little bit of parsing and then show you some of what we can do with the whole query stuff with source base and token positions and, and whatnot um, or maybe we don't really have time to get into that maybe I'll wait to do that next time, and then I'll do some of this more drudge worky stuff off screen. So maybe that's what we'll do. Maybe I'll stop here with this, and I will finish some of the drudge work, uh, AST porting, and, and also validating that the basic stuff works. I'll do that off stream, um, and then we will do some of the actual. And maybe I'll even have started the parsing. But some of the stuff I want to show you with the new AST and the new way we're going to do things is uh, we'll, we'll have a much better strategy for doing error recovery. Uh, like we don't really do any error recovery, so I have a good plan for that that will require minimal changes to code um, and, and will provide very high quality error recovery that will let you catch most errors in one run without creating a lot of spurious error reports. Um, and also I will show you some of the query stuff that you can use to, for example, um, Given any position, like once you've built an AST, um, once you've built an AST, how do you, like given a source position, how do you quickly find all of the nodes that enclose it? So, for example, if I am here, what are the things that enclose this? Well, there is this name itself, um, which is a type spec. Then there's the pointer type spec around it. Then there is this struct item, then there is this struct, and then there's finally the root document. So being able to do those sorts of queries or given a position, you can get the whole path to the root from the most specific node that contains the cursor all the way up to the root. Um, that's the kind of thing you need to do, um, for example, IDE queries, like I want to do auto completion in a given scope. You need to know that sort of stuff. So we can actually easily do that with our new range representation because the idea is that we have you know, our AST, everything has a range, and so you can simply drill down. You, you sort of look what node overlaps the cursor, and then you descend into it. And you, you, anytime there's a child of the current node that uh, a cursor falls into, you descend into that, and you build up sort of a path of all these parents leading down to the most specific node that contains the cursor. And from that, you can do various cool things. Um, so anyway, I want to show that next time, but we probably need to put a little more scaffolding and, and parsing code in place for that. So. I will do most of that off stream and then we will show some cool stuff next time. Um, for now though, we're still in the kind of the phase of the rewrite where things are pretty uh, copy and pasty and that's how it's going to be probably for a few more streams, but uh, we'll get there. And uh, this is getting much cleaner than what we had previously, which is encouraging. So anyway, I think that's it for the stream. Let me just check if there's questions and then we'll finish off. Um, boom, 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 boom. So I wasn't looking at chat during, um, what do you call it, uh, to look at chat while I was coding. So uh, James was asking, since you can walk the tree to find the location of the leftmost node and the location of the rightmost node, do we need to store a source range per node as opposed to just one source location? Um, you sometimes do. It's certainly true that in specific cases you can compress it and just find it on demand. The big uh, so, so the big thing you actually want to store this is the case I just mentioned. If you store the ranges all the way up the tree that are sort of like bounding boxes on the um, on the ranges, you can do very efficient query without having to descend into the tree. Like for example, suppose I have a big declaration. Um, I can know whether something falls in that declaration just using a single constant time check. Um, if I needed to uh, descend into it in order to find where it ends, then we would need to look maybe at its neighbor, but then we don't know 
where this thing ends and the neighbor begins, like what, what is the gap between them and stuff like that. So in certain cases you can for sure, like in a case like this, for example, um, the binary expression ends where B ends. And so you could just sort of descend into the rightward spine of the, uh, of the expression AST. But again, you would have to actually descend down there to get it. Having the ranges up front means that you can easily do that in constant time. And then there's some cases like, um, for example, if you have a statement list, um, like a statement block, um, the, 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 you, you want the end, you want the range to point to the closing thing here, uh, which is you know not exactly where the innermost subnode ends, basically. So there are cases where you could just you can recover it, but then it creates sort of non-uniform representation relative to the cases where you can't recover it, where maybe there's an extra token at the end. Um, and it also takes longer because you can't just do a constant time query from the cached range. So, yeah, I, I think this is the way to do it. But um, I, I thought about this too. There's definitely some cases where you can store less if you wanted to, if you're willing to do extra work. Um, so that's a bit of a trade-off. But having a, having a uniform representation for the range uh, makes it easier to write uniform code uh, as well. So uh, I think this is what I'm going to go with for now. Um, alrighty. Okay, I think that's it for today. Uh, yeah, this code is not super exciting, I know. Uh, we will probably get to some more exciting stuff next time when we do some of the queries. This is definitely something we couldn't do before, and also when we'll do some of the error recovery, which is something we weren't doing before. So expect that next time I, I need to stub in the rest of this AST, and I need to validate it, and uh, then we can do the, some of the more fun stuff. Um, but we still have to write the whole parser, which I will try to do most of off stream. It's like, it's not a lot of code, but it's not very hard code, but it's, you know, it's like a thousand lines of code it has to be rewritten. Uh, most of it will be roughly the same, but um, I guess I, maybe I can say a little bit about the error recovery strategy I have planned. Uh, I think I maybe alluded to it earlier in another stream, but basically the, the, the biggest thing is first off, being able to recover, um, the, the thing I want to achieve with the recovery is I don't just want syntactic recovery, I also want semantic recovery as much as possible. So there's kind of two things I have planned. The first is if things go very, very badly when par parsing something inside a declaration, you just sync back up to the top level where you try to find the next declaration. And you can do that heuristically very easily by searching for, um, um, for example, searching for uh, the, de the keywords. All declarations are set up by keywords like func struct. Uh, Etc., uh, and you can even use the column information to uh, get better heuristic information about that. So it's it's quite easy to do robust resync to the next declaration, and so that's sort of one kind of fallback around everything else. Then the other the other obvious case that everyone does is doing statement level uh, recovery. Is you just look for the next semicolon, uh, you you sync to the next semicolon. So that's the other thing you can do quite easily. Um, for all of these cases, one one concept that's quite common in sort of compiler design and, and which we'll do is the idea of having a kind of null object corresponding to AST nodes that were not correctly parsed. So for example, um, if you parse a statement and it turns out bad, you still put the statement in the, um, in the AST, but it's a bad statement. Like there's a kind of statement called bad statement or error statement or something like that. Uh, and so that way you still have actual information in the AST about something there. And in particular, you have a source range that actually corresponds to where you started parsing and where you resynced to the next statement or the next attempted statement um, that you tried to parse. And so you sort of have a nice way where you don't have to deal with the fact that everything can be null. You just have sort of a type of, of statement, for example, that, um, um, that, that marks uh, a statement that you couldn't parse, but you still have the range information, for example, which is helpful for some things. Um, and you can do that with, with decals too. Decals are a little bit different because if you consider, so, so that's sort of the syntax side. When you consider kind of recovery, once you go past parsing, there's actually all kinds of stuff you can do even if you have parsing errors. Like for example, if you have a parse error or any kind of error actually, including a type error inside a function definition, it basically doesn't matter outside of that function because the only thing the rest of the program cares about is the function signature. Every, no one else cares about what's inside the function. So um, 
not only do you have sort of a way of recovering from parse errors and, and detecting other parse errors in the same run, but you can actually proceed with most kinds of type resolution and other forms of semantic analysis uh, as long as things are inside functions. Those are the easiest cases. If you have any kind of error inside a function, as long as you can resync to the next declaration, it almost doesn't matter what happened inside that function in terms of what was it a syntax error? Was it a very bad syntax error or just kind of a bad syntax error? Was it a type error? Was it whatever? It doesn't matter. You can recover from that very reliably as long as um, you know it's inside a function. For other cases, it's maybe uh, more work and less uh, payoff. Like for example, if you have a uh, an error inside a struct definition then um, there's still plenty of things you can do uh, quite easily to continue doing type resolution, even if someone, uh, well, certainly as long as no one refers to it, you're good. If someone refers to it but doesn't need the size, like they have an incomplete, you know, they point to it but they don't need its size, then you can also go. But a lot of those cases, I think, are um, kind of long tail kind of cases in the sense that there's a bunch of them if you want to do a good job. They're probably worth doing in the long run, but um, they the main case I think you want to handle really well is errors inside functions. Uh, and those are very easy to deal with. Um, like you, there's basically never a reason a fun, an error inside a function, whether syntactic or semantic, should inhibit any an analysis elsewhere in the code. So that's going to be, I would say, the, the, the top of the sort of high level strategy for, uh, for doing a better job with this stuff in the new compiler is um, focusing on decal level resync and recovering from function definition errors, basically, uh, as, as, as good as possible. So, which, which should be quite easy. Doesn't, I don't think that should really require a lot, of, um, a lot of kind of error code to proliferate in the code base. It should be quite centralized and minimal. So anyway, that's the, that's the plan. Uh, we will hopefully get to that stuff next time. So uh, until then.